Herzlich willkommen zu 99 zu 1. Äh, Zwischenmahlzeit, heute haben wir ein Crossover mit Cedric Warren, den hole ich gleich rein. Das ist eine Aufzeichnung, also nicht, dass ihr denkt, dass ihr, ihr könnt ja zwar auch live mitchatten und ich bin selber wahrscheinlich auch selber im Chat mit dabei. Allerdings ist das nicht live, das habe ich voraufgezeichnet, weil ich demnächst äh, im Urlaub bin, äh, damit ihr auch ein bisschen Content bekommt, wenn ich weg bin. Okay, dann hole ich mal Cedric Warren direkt rein. Hallo Cedric Warren. Hallo, uh, guten Tag. Um, Good talk. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can. So you actually do you you do speak German, right? Yeah, uh, uh, very badly. Um, actually, I would say I read and write German more than I speak it now. Um, I was in München oh 20 years ago um, for nine yeah. months as an yeah. exchange student, um, and uh, when I go to pull German up, <laughs> uh, I speak it with such a bad American accent. And then I also forget my cases immediately. And it's just, um, so yeah, I but yes, yeah, so I, I do 20 years, German. 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, he understands, uh, he will understand your chat messages. So if you chat now live with us while this is being uh, broadcasted, take care because he's also, mm -hmm. uh, around in the chats. So, C. Derek Varn is a poet, a book editor, a podcaster, and a public school teacher in Utah. He previously taught in private education in South Korea, Mexico, and Egypt. He is the author of uh, Apocalyptics, as well as, a current, as currently writing on a book on Christopher Lash. Uh, he hosts the podcast Varn Vlog, which is um, the logo that you saw in the background of uh, the stream. Also, Theorizing with a Hammer, great uh, podcast on theory, breaking down how he basically brought together um, all the reading on theory that he did over uh, all those years uh, over at Zero Books, uh, Pop the Left podcast, as well as Mortal Science, a really great but yeah, kind of obscure, obscure <laughs> podcast on Marxism, post-Marxism maybe, or you know what to do with Marxism next. Uh, you have a quite interesting story on how you came to be a Marxist. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And maybe, maybe, maybe even tell us how you would categorize, categorize yourself today. Like, do you still call yourself a Marxist? Yeah. Um, I would say that I am still a Marxist, um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but my relationship to Marx, um, is complicated by, actually reading him um you know and going through <laughs> um and going through the materials uh slowly and painstakingly um and not just the materials that were readily available as far as the historical marxist trad tradition and say the SPD are in the ussr are in uh, china um but also the 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 maga 2 works as um have been Uh, coming out slowly in yeah. English. Um, so I right. actually had to break out my German a lot to, to verify, you know, secondary material. Um, the, you know, my history of how I became a Marxist is interesting though. Um, I was, I don't fit the profile of your average American Marxist. Um, in some ways, I would say I probably might be closer to the historical European experience of Marxism like in the 70s and 80s. But even that's kind of a question um, because I didn't learn Marx in the academy at all. Um, when I was in college was a time period um, at the end of the 90s and, and early aughts where Marxism was considered completely dead in the United States. There were some very tiny sectarian groups of about 2,000 people in a country of, at the time, 300 million. Um, you know, just to people get that perspective of how small this milieu was. Um, and you would occasionally encounter them at uh, very anarchist-driven uh, anti-globalization and anti-war protests. And when... I came out of the deep South um, in the United States. Um, I am an ethnic minority. Um, I know I don't look like it, but I am um, uh, Irish and Bulgarian Jewish by heritage, um, uh, which doesn't mean anything. I'm a, I'm a fucking American. But 
where I lived because of the notions of white identity, I was questionably white, um, which has changed throughout my lifetime because I'm, I'm older than I look. I'm 40. Um, and uh, I was the, the first generation of my family to go to school. And the only reason I wasn't the first person to graduate is my mom graduated college to become a nurse when I entered college. So she and I began education at roughly the same times. Um, she was a waitress most of my life, married a mechanic. Uh, um, and so I very much come out of a Southern blue collar world, but I was, uh, um, because of my biological father of, you know, I was Jewish. So in a place where that was very, very rare. I mean, there's lots of Jews in the United States, but not where I live. Um, right. Not when I grew up. And uh, I also grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood um, for most of my childhood. Um, and so I was not geared to be a Marxist. That was not a tradition that was openly readily available for working class people in the United States. Um, I got kind of into zine culture and to there's, there's equivalents in German, but um, just independent magazine culture, you know, um, mm -hmm. and the punk scene in the nineties as a teenager and got exposed to things like Chomsky from, uh, from basically a college educated scene that was adjacent to where I lived. But when I actually went out to meet leftists, um, uh, particularly in 1999, uh, we, a bunch of friends of mine saved a, uh, like literally saved, <laughs> we worked a bunch of, um, illegal loading docks jobs to save money to travel to the G8 protests, um, mm -hmm. in Seattle. And, uh, when we encountered the left, we responded with, this is a bunch of privileged, educated college people and some crazy people. That was our response. Um, right. uh, then nine 11 happened in the United States. Um, and even some of those leftists, be, you know, became, it's hard to, it, people will deny this now, but you had Marxist and stuff who are people who were, who were Marxist when I was in college, who became like rabid Islamophobes overnight for a very brief period of time. It was like this weird, hateful fever dream. Mm -hmm. Um, and I responded very negatively to that, um, but, and I became very anti-war. Um, and I went to another anti-war, anti-globalization protest, protesting the G8 and the capitulation to the, to the Afghan war um, in 2000, I think it's 2002, 2003. It's at Sea Island, which was off the coast of my home state. And none of the leftists were there except for this one uh, group that would later become a Stalinist group, although it was not yet um, around international answer. And these right wingers who were opposed to the GOP. Um, and so they kind of souped in on me and got me interested in, um, in um, paleoconservatism. Um, which, uh, and, and if, for, for people in Europe, um, these people were adjacent and kind of more less esoteric versions of what in Europe you might call the European new right. Um, mm -hmm. they were not as fascist, but like, uh, Alain de, bon, uh, uh, de Boniste, or however you say his name, I, I butcher French worse than I butcher German. Um, <laughs> uh, um, was readily read in the circles that I was in. And given that I have a multi-ethnic um, family and, you know, my, my, my cousins are, are uh, half Korean and, and stuff like that, um, I started noticing this racial undercurrent and kind of, and also was responding to the libertarianism. And I, I started predicting that we were going to have major economic problems in 2005 because the entire economy seemed based off a credit bubble. 
And I started reading as much economics as I could in the post. I was reading early post Keynesians. Um, I was reading Austrians and I was reading neoclassicals and I started reading Marxists, um, which it was hard to find in 2005. I mean, there, you know, uh, this was even before David Harvey did his whole like capital introduction, which I think sure, happened sure, sure. like five or six years later. Um, and I, I found their theory of the business cycle to be more explanatory than other theories I had seen, particularly the overproduction um, and also the focus. Um, I started reading Marxist writings on rents and rents as a way to compensate for low profitability. And I had worked um, in the service sector um, and then in insurance and I knew what the profitability rates were, what the profit margins really were, and they were low. Um, um, they were much lower than people realized, even though individual capitalists were becoming mega rich, um, they weren't reinvesting uh, in, the, in the way that you would expect. And in the way that I was taught in classical economics and, and in a way these paleo conservatives I was around told me what happened, um, you know, with some exceptions from, their, from the European New Right people, uh, it was, um, it was eye opening. Um, also I had, as I mentioned in the beginning, I had, um, spent a little time in Germany right before it, the EU was formally established, like, like, like a few months before, um, 99, 98, 99, or... 99, 99. Yeah. I was, I was, uh, 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 sophomore in college and I got a scholarship to to do uh, um, German language studies um, um, and philosophy studies in 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 Munich um, and so I took that up because I'd never you know I uh, I had not been to Europe um, of course <laughs> like sure. where would I get the money yeah. for that um, and you know uh, luckily for me um, it was a time when you could live in Germany for, for nine months with about $2,000 saved, um, which yeah. you absolutely cannot <laughs> do now. Um, but, nope. <laughs> but uh, you know, even, even with a scholarship, <laughs> um, but you know, it would, so I was exposed to, um, to, to Nietzsche he uh, and Hegel and, and Schiller mm. and Kant and all that um, in German. Um, and so I had the background knowledge um, in German philosophy to kind of approach the more obscure parts of Marx. And I was wondering why I'd never been taught any of it, um, like at all. Like, I mean, you know, we were given the manifesto once in college and, and it was taught very stupidly. Um, you know, I wouldn't even say it was anti, it wasn't even anti Marxist propaganda. It was just ignorant. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, like, oh, hey, look at these demands. Oh, we already have most of these demands anyway, um, you know, in the manifest, which is true, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, th I, was, I think it was kind of this kind of liberal, like, well, Marx actually wasn't wrong for the time. He was wrong for later on and blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. And so that's how, you know, those things kind of coalesce together. And then the financial crisis really hit in 2007. Um, and I also went back to my hometown as a public school teacher and saw how hard it was for people to move classes in my country that told people all the time that they could, um, you know, and it was like, no, they, they can't. Like, even if they do get yes, educated, you mean, you mean upward, upward, upward mobility, yeah, upper mobility was yeah. non-existent. Like, even if yeah. you did what you were supposed to do went to college, got a, a white collar job, you were so saddled with debt that you actually probably made less than your blue collar parents. And um, that experience was, you know, just, it shattered any, any kind of lingering paleo conservatism I had. Um, but at that time, there still wasn't a whole lot of anything to join up with in the United States. Um, there was a few Trotskyist groups and uh, two social democratic groups, kind of. Um, and then some weird internet based, like anti imperialist groups that are all gone now, like Kasama Project. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, 
we were kind of just in this weird hyper minoritarian milieu until Occupy happened. And Occupy started off as a very liberal anarchist movement, but you could feel, you know, like, um, you could feel that something was changing. I actually, at this point, had left the United States and was now observing it from abroad. Um, and I was a professor of education in South Korea. Um, and I had to go back to the United States for uh, a conference. And so I was in New York and I went to Occupy Wall Street and it felt like that 90s uh, anti-globalization anarchism, that ab busters, the early Naomi Klein stuff. I don't know how much of this you saw in Germany, but I'm assuming a lot um, mm. was dying. But it, but it didn't know it was dying. Like you just, you felt like it was changing rapidly. Um, that it didn't have an answer for the kind of problems they were running into. You had a black liberal president. You had, um, you had popular sentiment against the war. You started having people talking about class in America explicitly for the first time in 30 years. Um, and yet, um, the anarchist left milieu had very little to say about that. Um, it, they, you know, what they put on the table was a uh, kind of post Keynesianism that, you know, that you saw around Syriza in Greece, actually. And that was what everybody's right. model was going to be. And yeah. then um, they got really, frankly, stupidly, uh, um, optimistic about the Arab Spring. Um, right. And so by this point, I, I am working abroad um, because the public schools in my area have almost completely collapsed under these conservative reforms. Um, and they had laid off a fourth of their teaching staff. And uh, to avoid getting laid off, because where I was from at that time, if you lost your teaching job, you were blacklisted, even if you were just laid off, like there was you were just not going to get another job. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I, I put in my resignation and I left the country and then started going back and forth. And as I was in uh, South Korea and in Mexico and in Egypt during most of the Obama, well, during almost all the, the Obama administration, I became radicalized by encountering foreign movements, but also watching what was going on in my home country, um, from abroad. And when I started, um, engaging with the left in the U S I actually started doing it through podcasts. Um, but I actually, I mean, in all honesty, it kind of had a distorted view of it because my view of it was what we saw, um, online because that was what I had access to or what I saw when I visited major cities for work. Um, mm. so when I would go into the Bay area for a conference or St. Louis for a conference or New York for a conference, um, uh, when I came back to the United States after the Trump election, and I, you know, and I didn't really want to, honestly, in, in my mind, I wasn't going to ever come back to this godforsaken country. Um, <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's 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 odd. If you attack the United States, Europeans, in my mind, don't get to attack the U.S., but I do, and um, <laughs> and also, I've always found that like particularly with French and, and British anti-Americanism that I suspect there's jealousy involved in it yeah. as much as anything else. Um, you know, there might be real moral imperative, but there's, a, there's also, they're, they're kind of pissed off. We stole their empire from them. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, so, uh, cause you know, <laughs> it's one of those things. Um, and, and actually my experience in Europe uh, was demystifying for me. Because when I was a kid, we idolized Europeans as like a place where there was an actual left tradition, um, where there were actual radicals, you know, uh, of all varieties, even weird postmodernist ones. And that in America, we never really had that. Um, later on, I discovered it wasn't true that we never really had that and that the European side of it was overrated while I was there. I was just sort of like, yeah, yeah, y'all aren't that different from us. <laughs> that was my mm -hmm. response. No, I do think so. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, I mean, that's a long convoluted story, but 
uh, and not, and no, it's, I mean, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's fine. Yeah, it's no, it's a, it's an interesting story. I mean, the, this paleo conservatism, like you, you compare it to the, to the new, to the, no, to the European new right, new right here in yeah. Germany. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I it, more, inf it was it more influenced by, by France, um, than in Germany. I mm -hmm. mean, like, so mm -hmm. Greca, uh, you know, that weird. Mm -hmm quasi fascist think tank had a lot of influence um uh the now infamous richard spencer <laughs> uh the yeah. american like uh uh post nazi i guess um was somebody that i was aware of when i was in those circles um this was very early it was before the alt right had branded itself or anything like that um he was the culture editor of uh, of American conservative magazine, which at the time was run by Pat Buchanan. And they never published this European New Right stuff, but there is this uh, Jewish scholar, Paul Gottfried, who would mention it offhand. And a lot of people in the seemingly libertarian milieu I was in would right. be... Yes reading these books um okay. kind of secretly so when a lot of those people became explicit nationalists right before trump i wasn't surprised like it, it had been Got something it. that i'd seen coming for about 10 years um the libertarianism never fulfilled a lot of people um because you, you would get in the like crazy contradictions like um they're uh you know um non-coercion stuff but they were totally okay with property taken from indigenous people and and even as a paleo conservative i was like that doesn't make sense like you can't believe that um or they would they would basically like talk about john locke and use justifying property ownership and i'm like well how can john locke couldn't have even believed that he lived during the enclosures like that's obviously a myth um, and this was, this was before I was, um, a Marxist. It was just, I was just doing the research and going, well, that's stupid. You can't really believe that. Like that's, um, and mm -hmm. a lot of people really didn't. Um, and apparently a lot right. more of them didn't than we knew. But, uh, yeah, I knew who Richard Spencer was. I knew who Stefan Molyneux was before he came out as a racist. I, like All these right. people were in this milieu. Yeah, it was interesting because, you know, I have some family in, in Ohio, mm -hmm. in Cleveland. They are, they are uh, emigrated Palestinians, that, well, Palestinians that actually emigrated to Lebanon, and then from there they emigrated to um, Canada and the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and they're not, not really left by any stretch of the imagination, but they always had, because of their upbringing, had this anti-imperialist streak to them, right? And also very anti-American in, in some ways, but in other ways not. Um, and in this time, around September 11, uh, some of my cousins there started sharing a lot of Ron Paul stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? um, is that is that like a, adjacent to the scene that you're talking about? Yeah, it was my gateway drug in. It was my gate. It was mm -hmm. Ron Paul and okay. Lou Rockwell. Then from them, Pat Buchanan, who mm -hmm. had been big in the 90s when I was a kid. Um, mm -hmm. And then from Pat Buchanan, Joe Sobrin, who was this... Uh, kind of rabid anti-Semite, ironically, but you, you have to read a lot to know that, um, who would, who, had, who had left the national review. Then you would get people who, uh, are, were dead at the time or, uh, we're getting close to it. Like Sam Francis, who was a racial nationalist and he was scary because he didn't hide that he was a racial nationalist, but then you'd encounter someone like Paul Godfrey, who was in this larger circle, um, who, he was Jewish and urbane and highly educated. He was Marcuse's student, actually. Um, okay. So he had a direct link to the Frankfurt School. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so it didn't it didn't come off as, you know, fascist adjacent, frankly. Um, and they yeah, were opposing no, they the too. war and they were anti-imperialist and they were more consistent than the Marxist and the Democratic people that you met because i mean the democrats mm -hmm. were all over the place and the marxist they just seemed you know the marxist you would meet just seemed like they were democrats but more so and would say stuff like um full support for the taliban 
and stuff like that, which to any American, even if you think the war is stupid and we should leave the Taliban alone, just comes off as like, what? Yeah, like, like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Like why? Totally. No. Why should we be supporting people that we would think were reactionaries if they were in our own society? So like, um, it just came off as utterly incoherent, and they didn't seem incoherent. Not at first. You had to get pretty deep in to realize what was going on. So yes, Ron Paul was kind of the gateway drug. Gr Glenn right. Greenwald was kind of a great ray drug. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, people yeah. think he's off script now, but I read him as a right winger at the end of the Bush administration, when I was coming out of being a right winger, you know, mm -hmm. and we were, you know, again, I was in a dissonant faction. We opposed the GOP. Like we were, we were more anti-Republican in some ways than the left was in the United States, as far as like the left of the Democrats. Um, yeah. um, it's very interesting, quite an interesting constellation. that happened. Yeah. There. yeah. It's a very minority position, but it looked like Ron Paul, and I know people don't like this comparison, but I think it's actually true. Ron Paul for the Republicans is very similar a figure to Bernie Sanders for the left in the United States and the left of the Democrats. Um, because Ron Paul was consistently anti-war. Um, and a lot of people who were even left wing didn't realize all his other policies. They just responded to somebody um, being anti-war in that the left of the Democrats at the time would have been like Mike Gravel, who I actually canvassed for in 2008, back when I still did electoral politics, and um, Dennis Kucinich were so weak that everybody was like, no. Um, and all of Ron Paul's politics weren't obvious to people. But this, all of Trump's weird rhetoric and his incoherence about like American imperialism, his anti NATO rhetoric, that had been simmering in this anti-war right in the united states okay. for two decades Got it. Okay. Like, it didn't surprise me at all when trump happened and i was one of the few leftists who wasn't even that afraid of it because i, I was like it's an incoherent position he's not going to be able to do much um he'll be right. you know he might can cause havoc for internal american bureaucracies but he's not going to be able to like radically change the immigration regime or anything like that um and so i'm like it's bad but it's not the end of the world. And I was one of the few leftists at the time who said that. And in fact, I was. Or, or, or if it's the end of the world, it already started before him. Right. Well, like the, that, the, yeah, the end of the world started with probably Eisenhower, frankly. But like, <laughs> like, you know, that's how far back it yeah. goes. Um, yeah. OK, let's let's go. Let's go back to the Marxism or let's go forward to the Marx, Marxism, mm -hmm. because, I mean, since then, you've been you've been doing a lot of um education there um also through your podcast work um and in pop the left i think the the thematic premise of pop the left is to um understand go back in time look at leftist movements especially also you know uh, early early 20th century and try to basically learn from that as you know learn from mistakes and then maybe build something on that that's uh, that's more or less how i understood it, understood at least doc's view program and, and and you go through a lot of history there and through a lot of different writers um and uh yeah i i would say that you are probably uh out of the two of you you're probably the one who, who actually goes um goes quite deep into this stuff mm -hmm. and i would like just like to know after all this studying what do you think is going on why why is the revolution not here yet where is marxism what's happening there what are these findings can we do something about it or um uh, like do you have an idea what we should do next are there open questions Packle? um yeah so that's it's a, a big question but we get some time. <laughs> yeah so i know i have uh for when i would say that the situation in in europe the situation in in Asia and the situation in the United States are directly related to things that happened in Europe in the early 20th century and in the late 19th century. What I would also say, however, is that developments through the 20th century was was radically different because of the results of three things. Um, one was not the Great Depression, actually, but the Long Depression in the U.S. Um, 
which ended its ability to pretend that we had a stateless laissez-faire capitalism that could be relatively re regulated. Um, when combined with the World War I, the size of the U.S. state, like, quadrupled. Um, and if early Marxist predictions had been correct, capitalism should have collapsed from an overproduction crisis in about 1920. It didn't. Um, for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which Lenin was actually, I think, quite right about is understanding. And people, when they approach imperialism, they don't approach it with two tendencies of capitalism uh, that are spelled out of Marx together as imperialism as an answer for it. Um, and it's an interesting problem because what Lenin is picking up on, he's picking up on, you know, uh, British liberal and uh, anti-imperialism, but he's also picking up on Hilferding and finance capital. And the com the contradiction between the um, declining rates of profits, which, by the way, people might say is, you know, um, your, your German scholar, Michael Heinrich, will say that it's not yeah. a thing. And he's right that it isn't argued for in Marx. Right here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, I, have a, I have a complicated relationship with Heinrich because he's famous in the U.S. for two positions that I don't love. But I actually okay. think he's one of the best philologists on Marx that there is. So it's like, mm -hmm. um, but for example, uh, I think he's objectively right that Marx doesn't prove the tendency of the rate of profits to fall. Mm -hmm. I also think it's statistically provable. Um, it is not provable in terms of value. It is provable in terms yeah, of value. Yeah, yeah. He, he, of, he, of he basically advocates... He basically advocates for dismissing it and just letting it go because it's it's nonsense. That's what right. I mean. And I I think he's wrong about that. I think he's right mm -hmm. that Marx doesn't argue for it well. Okay. Um, yep. uh, because that theory of crisis does explain why Kowski was wrong about ultra-imperialism at the time period that they were at. And this is kind of, you know, for people who don't know Marxism, Kowski had this theory that the imperialist powers were too productive to risk going to war with one another. And ironically, and this is something I'll get to later, he's right in a later time period, but he's wrong at the time period they're at. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, that that need for new profits ne needed more accumulation and you needed to do that through basically having forms of more primitive and i use quotation marks here because i hate that word in its associations in english uh the german actually doesn't have that the winks that it does in english so um it's important to note but the primitive uh forms of a capitalist accumulation in other parts of the world um and that this would lead to competition to get out of the other tendency that we saw in Marxism. This is one that Heinrich doesn't refute, which is uh, the tendency towards centralization and monopolization. Um, mm -hmm. And that those two things clash together. Okay, easy enough. Um, that, that, that throws social democracy and eventually in World War II, even the communist into a tizzy they can't respond to. Partly... Because of another question in Marxism that's never been completely answered. Um, and uh, Moshe Postone is actually probably is, you know, he can be obscure, but he's good on this question. That the national question and the relationship between a particular people and a universal uh, economic system is never reconciled. Um, that Marx's adoption of it makes good sense strategically in the 19th century, as far as breaking up these like early absolutist and late feudal empires in Europe um, and their forms of accumulation. Um, but it doesn't make a lot of sense once those nations start develop their internal identity, which often blocks their ability to form um, class unity. That's one problem. And two problems, if they're not already socialist and most of them don't have the developed capacity to be, um, they have to become um, not just capitalists, but they kind of have to become micro-imperialist in their immediate region. 
to get their resources that they need. Right. Um, this is a major problem for European and Asian Marxism. It kind of isn't a problem for North American Marxism because we're already settler colonial empires. It's already been done. Um, we have a different problem that emerges. And our problem is, one, um, for a very brief period in our history, our working class does seem to be given almost its worth and value. All right. Um, from you mean post, post Second World War? Right. Or, Specifically right. from the end of the Great Depression through the Second World War to about 1961. All right. Now, it's not true that they were not exploited. That's not true. And then there's malice, sure, sure, sure. basically yes. conspiracy theories. But the, the rate of exploitation was actually quite low. The the um, the bourgeoisie actually did, for example, during the end of the Great Depression and during the post-war boom, it would when there was an economic downturn, it took the hit, not the working class, which is historically quite weird. Mm -hmm. It only makes sense. When you look at like uh, what Paul Maddock Sr. called the post, uh, the Keynesian internationalism are, are the rebuilding of Europe to expand our capital sector. So it was kind of a benign, a seeming benign form of imperialism, actually. The Marshall Plan was a way to rebuild capital in a way that could uh, really help those who were in the, the capitalist sphere of Europe, but do so at basically making a almost an international polity sub subordinate to the U.S. And you see this in the way NATO operates. Um, that is only possible because the U.S. had 50% of the world's wealth and about 2% of the world's hands. And it only had that, not because it took it from the other places, although it took plenty, but because World War II destroyed all the competitors' wealth literally in, a, in, in the fires of the war. Um, so what you're saying is basically that because er like basically er everyone in Europe at least got burned to the ground. Right. And the U.S. didn't. The U.S. Mm -hmm. didn't even like, ma okay, maybe Pearl Harbor, but that's it. Uh, they didn't they didn't have any fights on their grounds. No, no capital destroyed there. And then they could just go to Europe and rebuild. And, yep. and by that, expand their productivity. That's what you're saying. Exactly. So they could take care of their excess productivity um, and send it to other countries. Um, right. But this is not an ex is that then an extraction of would you say that's an extraction of value from Europe to um, to the US? Sort of. Um, it's an extraction of some value, but not a lot. What it really is is um, is a way to just get rid of sur of of surplus production so that it doesn't accumulate in our area. All right. Markets, now what we basically. yeah, what we did also do, however, and this is in the context of the Cold War is the extractive part happens elsewhere. So th that whole Keynesian tactic, which required, it actually did require super high marginal tax rates on the rich to maintain and build Europe. And while they were getting tons of profits from doing that, actually, uh, mm -hmm. they were having to pay out a lot to do it to the government. To just to... So what they start looking to do with U S military support is extract in other areas. And these are the places where we didn't rebuild after the war and they couldn't do it to China because of the communist revolution. They couldn't really do it to some of the Southeast Asian countries, actually like they didn't really do it to Japan and Korea. Um, but they could do it almost indiscriminately in Latin America. Um, mm -hmm. And they did. And they, they aided doing it in Africa by assuming control of a lot of the economic relations with the former French and British client states as they got mm -hmm. independence and providing predatory loans to them. Um, furthermore, through international uh, legal treaties and trade negotiations um, and basically labor arbitrage, they were able to keep the development capacity of the indigenous work in a lot of these areas low. So they were just able to keep tech out, technology out, um, and uh, and internal development down, and also just limited a lot of the, the ability for some of these states to even demand for you know rightful compensation um, from the workers' movements where they were more active 
in these countries. And they did so up to and including, you know, helping governments just mow those people down. Um, right. Th that created a, a U.S. left that uh, was not motivated by economic concerns. They were able to to focus on on different modes of oppression and in doing so highly divi divided their own base. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that had already been done um, in the U.S. and the South for um, basically 100 years. One of the things that, that people don't know um, and that it's hard for people to understand is that the average black worker in the Northeast of the United States actually made more money than the average white worker in the South. The South okay. was used as a kind of internal colony after the Civil War, um, mm -hmm. both for cheap black labor, which could be which was but because of prison laws, almost re-enslaved, but also because by playing up racial tensions, you could short white laborers, too, by always having a ready black force to scab on them, um, which was how it was used. So right. there were waves of both racist, you know, explicitly racist uh capitalist action and as soon as people started organizing um they uh you know you know someone like uh um carnegie would be would discover that his anti-racism and then go employ a bunch of black workers to come in and work for even cheaper and break the strike um which stopped the labor movement from developing in the u.s particularly in the south um, entirely and led to an extractive economy in the Southeast. And then when that left um, uh, during the 50s, 60s and 70s, it was replaced by, by a military economy by using right. the Southeast as a way to basically get your troops. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of my antipathy towards the war, which I haven't explained, was because we all hated it, but also because where I lived, you either went into the military um, and were used as fodder, um, basically. To and if you survived, you had a decent life through military Keynesianism. Or you got educated, or you were just poor. That was those were your options, you know. Um, right. And this is part of the United States. I don't think Europeans really understand is how our regional dynamics actually were no, used. No, not not at all. Not at um, all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it also led to resentment of the southeastern worker. Not just because of their racism, which was constantly being stoked, be even in a material sense, because black people were being used to undercut their wages. And instead of, you know, sure. and the, uh, the communists actually realized this was a problem in the United States. The CPUSA did active anti-racist campaigns because they saw this pattern. Um, what screwed it up, thank you, Europe, was uh, um, specifically related to Germany, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. and that was third periodism had been disastrous for the, for the European left, uh, particularly in Germany, but it actually had been good for the American left because the, the communists did not work with either of the bourgeois parties. And we didn't have an indigenous labor party to pull from our labor party had been killed in 1920 in the first war, more or less at, with the arrest of, uh, of, uh, Eugene Debs. We, our Socialist Party never got, got off the ground, even when it could command 19 to 20 percent of the vote, um, which, again, yeah, is something. not yeah. well known. Um, uh, what happened, what happens after 1936 is that um, the communists have to enter a popular front with the Democrats. Well, the Democrats are the party of segregation at this time also something that even most americans don't always remember it wasn't the republicans yeah it exactly. was not the republicans it was mm -hmm. in fact until fdr the black vote was was almost 100 percent republican after fdr's second term it became 60 percent democrat but they had to do so in a coalition with segregationist um and then the mm -hmm. communist party also enters into that coalition um ironically this is later used during the second or third or fourth Reich scare, depending on how you count, to suppress, you know, all the um, socialistic elements in the Democratic Party because you kept on accusing them of being communist. And if you dug deep enough because of the popular front periods, a lot of them were. 
So not when I say a lot, I, a lot of the communists were in the Democratic Party. There weren't a lot of Democrats who were communists, but we need to get that clear. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But so that's what was used. It was a weird bait and switch. So the CPUSA got screwed over twice. It stopped its ability to really organize in the South because it had to kowtow to segregationists while trying to run an anti-racist campaign to build workers' rights in the Southeast, which was never unionized in any significant way. Um, while also later on having their associations with the Democrats being used to purge them from both the unions and then and then from Hollywood and everywhere else, and having any a lot of the Democrats adjacent to them purge during the McCarthy era Red Scare. So they got hit twice. And that's in addition to the fact that occasionally some of those people will get called up to the USSR and just never come back. So, you know, fun stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. So the American situation is very different from the European situation, but it is a communist international and they're constantly complicating each other. Um, and then we, you know, I don't have to tell Europeans about what the Cold War did to their ability to organize. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's that problem. There's then another problem I've noticed. Marxists have never figured out how to handle the state and how powerful it's thought the state really was. If you read, you know, um, uh, state and revolution by Lenin, um, a lot of, you know, classic Marxists just trust the state, but we can't go full anarchist and abolish it overnight. It's just clearly stated. But one of the things that everyone seems to be shocked by is how powerful the bourgeois state in the West could become so fast. All right. No one saw that. Okay. Um, and that's something that, you know, we, we talk about 1970 style revolutions, right? You're going to have that against a nuclear armed state or against a state that can run drones. Um, you might right. be able to you, some some Marxists will try to moderate model it on an insurgency model um, based off of kicking out occupiers. But if you actually study warfare, an occupation war and a civil war have totally different um, win patterns. And one of the reasons why is an occupation war for the for the occupier, eventually it costs more to stay in even if you're mowing down five times the, the losses that you're taking. I mean, you look, hell, we can look at Afghanistan today, literally today, and see this dynamic. In a civil war, because it's an absolute fight to, for survival, um, the side that takes the most losses loses, unless it is willing to find ways to take those losses um, because there is an exception historically, actually, is the United States, but um, through conscription of outside parties. So, for example, um, the the Union Army in the Civil War with the with the South lost two soldiers for every one Southern soldier, but because of immigration and becomes it was literally just throwing Irish people off the ship into mm -hmm. uh, into the war was able to take just would, had the people to take way more losses and still have more people. Um, okay. Which is not the case for the South, which was a lot more sparsely populated, particularly when you, you know, are not including all the slaves. So it was, you know, it was a very different dynamic. If, if you tried to do that in the U S today, basically the odds are is that the federal government would absolutely win. Um, Sure. Because yeah. it could inflict like triple the, the, the casualties. And there's no reason for it not to because it's a war of absolute survival at that point. Um, and I say this because a lot of Marxists talk a lot about revolution and then they don't study wars and war patterns and what this actually takes. Um, uh, this is a lot of reasons why they misread events in other countries and also misappropriate both the U.S. left and the European left, um, for some reason, thought that the models of national liberation um, in, you know, non-core countries would somehow be a model for what could happen in the core countries. And that is, when you look at it in the terms of studying warfare, absurd. 
actually. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there was just years of spinning wheels trying to find another subject to do the work for you. Um, so we underestimated how powerful the state was, and we over relied on the state without seeing that it could have its own class interests, um, which I think has been disastrous um, at different times in history, and including during some high points of the USSR. Um, so, you know, and there's a reason why, for example, when uh, when the Erfurt program was written, Ingalls is criticizing um, Kalski for for not for not using socialization and communization as opposed to uh, nationalization. And mm. um, in the in the Erfurt program, it's really the only problem Ingalls really has. But he he harps on it a lot in his critique but he does sign off on um the airfoot program um well that 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 problem with the state you know goes on forever because we, we in a way we make the anarchists look right in how many times we've allowed state bureaucracies to start developing yeah. independent class interests um you know even when they come out of the working class the, the thing is we we somehow you know, forget that to be a part of the working class, you actually have to be a worker actively. It is not something you're just born into once. It's not this like, right. uh, you know, this notion. And this is also this is a particular problem for the British left because the British, because they never, you know, they're the first, they're the oldest form of capital, capital, but they're also like the least demedievalified. Black. That's a terrible mm -hmm. word, but. Um, they still have a lot of the. They still have. They still have lords, feudal yeah. lords, basically. They still have feudal lords who collect taxes. Exactly. Like, um, right. uh, because of that, they have a different. You know, their cultural notions of working class that develop, and that's also true in the United States for different reasons. Um, that prevent a lot of talk of class unity, and you see it even today. This is why, like, you start seeing me get a little nervous when people start mentioning stuff like professional managerial class because yeah, yeah, and... yeah you know why um be, not because they're describing something false in, in in the case of the most elite but because when you tack it down you're actually you're you're, you're saying that a labor arist uh, aristocracy is a completely separate class it has completely separate interests and that's that's a not true and b actually in the united states if you were to say kick out all people who have a college education under 35 you kick out 60 percent of the of the workforce immediately yeah like yeah. it's um uh no, i'd be a pmc i think you would be a pmc too. yeah i would definitely be yeah yeah um and i find it hilarious that the people who put this out are all like brits and swedes and then americans <laughs> lap it up um so just to point out where, where that, that that term doesn't come from them. It does come from Barbara Ehrenreich, but like that's who yeah. repopularized it in the particular way it is being used now. Um, right. Don't trust Brits and Swedes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. I mean, so how about how about like, you already brought it to today? So how how about the Marxism today? I must say, like in Germany, um, probably you noticed this back then too. Maybe not. Popular culture works like U.S. Uh, American popular culture, of course, also works in Germany, but it's always there's always a slight delay, right? Yeah. So I would say I would say that there has been like a popular shift um, in the U.S. Um, allowing, you know, for you guys to uh, maybe since 2015 or maybe before that, I'm not sure, to speak about Marx again and to talk about classes and all this stuff, and and this has kind of reached us like. Maybe maybe like two years ago, right? So a little later, we also have our own Jacobin magazine right now, right? <laughs> and cool, it's becoming hip. We have some, you know, some uh, YouTubers and all the stuff, and and even on, on on state media, you hear people talking about classes suddenly. Um, there are many Marxists today, uh, self-prescribed Marxists, especially on the Jacobin left in the U.S., but also now in Germany, who believe that the main issue that we have, so the biggest problem not the one that you're talking about, but it's more like the practical organizing of a so-called working class. Mm -hmm. So somehow there are all these workers out there or there is this working class out there and we need to figure out the way how to organize them. 
and by organized like it's sometimes not clear what they mean by it um but many times actually it feels like especially when they're talking in germany it feels like they're talking about blue blue color wage laborers right to get them um, back to unionize so unions become very important and um they actually now after bernie sanders they they shifted and it becomes clearer and clearer also in germany that their demands are actually social democratic like openly social democratic demands um what are your stance on this because if i talk to some of those people i actually know some people of the magazine here their idea is of course and i think maybe that's even sanders's idea which is yeah, we start with a social democracy and we undermine the state and we you know we build our power and that will take some time and then at, in the end we'll get to socialism maybe even without uh, violence and without revolution so what what do you think on this um uh, on the state that we are in are we in a crisis of marxism or is this going somewhere i think we're um i think we're in we're in a paradox um or a profound contradiction um whereas Marxism has been repopularized, um, but the cost of moving the quote Overton window has actually been coherence um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and self-honesty. Uh, I, for example, point out that the progressive left of the 2000s and the Marxists now believe a lot of the same things despite a change in vocabulary. Um, mm -hmm. The anti-imperialists uh, have the same positions, even though now they have a hang up for China and uh, can ignore <laughs> certain kinds of objective conditions there. Um, the, the problem with the thesis of organizing the working class in America, it's a little different in Germany, actually, and we can go into that, um, is that the American working class is either in the service sector or it's, or it's labor aristocratic. The entire structure of unions, and this, this is not even looking at the legal problems in the U.S. that are unique to it because we have laws that prohibit certain things that are legal in Europe. But, um, right. but uh, the entire structure of, of classical labor unionizing is based on a factory model. Automation, even more than outsourcing, um, is ending that capacity worldwide. And that is the most true in the United States. The United States is still the second or third biggest producer of raw, uh, of raw commodities on earth. People don't realize it because no one works in that sector because it is so heavily automated. They think it all went elsewhere. And yes, the Eurozone altogether can compete with the US and China outproduces it. But it still produces a ton of material. The other thing is these three producers and all of these three regional zones, despite, you know, competition and back and forth between Europe playing China off of us and us playing, right. you know, um, we're all mutually dependent of each other to complete products. Like completed products actually rely on all three zones of production. Um, so that's one problem. You have a, you have a truly global proletariat. Another problem is, and this is one that Marxists didn't expect, is that we did not foresee sectional interests becoming more intense as proletarianization was almost universal. And what do I mean by that? Well, something like 80% of the population meets the definition of, of uh, working class by Marx, by meaning producing value in some way or servicing the, the circuit of value in some way. All right. Being socially necessary for the circuit of value in some way that may not be they may not be productive laborers, but they're socially necessary laborers. So you have those two things. Mm -hmm. um, and yet um, there's less even when we talk about class, there's less coherence about what it means than there's ever been before. People are positing all kinds of ad hoc theories of class to to explain why there isn't that unity if you think you're going to go in and organize a bunch of factories and Germany does have less automated factories and more workers, but I'm going to get to the catch sure. there and I can tell people where to look up this information. Um, yeah, great. Uh, then the United States does. The issue is um, who are you going to organize? Um, in Germany, the catch is 
German German demographic crisis also has paired with a dark underbelly of your immigration policy. All right. And that is, you know, what's been driving Merkel. You know, Merkel's incoherence, good old mommy Merkel, uh, money Merkel, whatever you want to call it. Mommy me. Merkel, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Muti, um, Muti Merkel. Yeah. Muti Merkel. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, she, she, her stances on immigration, in so much that Americans have followed German politics, which to be fair, they kind of don't, except when liberals get a boner for, for, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Good luck translating that. But um, let liberals get a hang up uh, for um, for for uh, U- European conservatives because they sound so much more sophisticated than ours. Um, mm. Because we don't speak the actual language, and so of course they sound more sophisticated, right? Um, <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, um, the the uh, the the difference is. While German workers have had protections actually kind of equivalent to the, what we talked about in the United States after in the 1950s, um, they have done so at having a, a permanent worker status that has high protections and, and, and that don't exist in, in North America, and particularly the U.S. and Mexico. Um, but they've done so by having temporary laborers make up a larger and larger portion of the economy and the labor dynamics that apply to them are actually worse than the labor dynamics in the United States. Yes. Yeah. Um, so who are you going to organize a, 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 a labor aristocracy that has no real investment into changing that. And I don't see this as a moral condemnation. Like, you know, if I'm in Germany, I want one of those good jobs. I, you know, who does not Yeah, sure. Of sure, course. Sure. And you can't blame people for that, but it's the division in the labor. And unless you acknowledge that, as part of your fundamental strategy, you have nothing to stand on. Furthermore, like I was talking about the regional distinctions in the United States, the Eurozone has similar regional distinctions. Are you willing to organize people in Romania or Greece? Because that's what you really need to do. Mm-hmm. You know, um, ger- yes, German workers produce more. And uh, there's been some weird Europe, uh, British people who talk about these production cycles as if somehow um, the United States is exploiting Germany and it's, it it is like being imperialized by the U S which I think is hilarious. Um, It it just tells you that they have something fundamentally wrong in their understanding of capital flows, but um, because they're only looking at one side of it. Um, Mm -hmm. But where would you do that in Germany? Who is that to do that with? Like if you, if, if your function is to, is to just to organize the German worker better. Like, uh, you, you would actually do so at the cost of some of your own workers. Um, if you were to really push it down, this is why I think Heinrich's rejection of uh, the decline risk of profit is suspect. Um, if you read Aaron uh, Benyedev's book um, on automation, automation he has, is future work, right? Yeah. He mm-hmm. has he has hard evidence after hard evidence that there is less profitability in the system. No, it's not justified in the way Marx wrote it down in Capital. It's not. It's justified statistically, um, but there's it explains a whole lot of what you're seeing, and there are numbers for it, um, and it's driven largely by by automation because automation eventually becomes. Um, fixed capital you know it's yeah it is you know something that happens over time um you can't you can only exploit a machine to the point of cost once you've done that that's it you can push people all kinds of places um you know there's there's more give and take with human labor um and so that's that's what I think inhibits that strategy in Germany. Um, in the U.S., it's even more daunting. Um, we are more automated. Uh, most of what we do in the U.S. is raw extraction, so we still have a lot of mining, and then finishing. So we're at the beginning and end of the process, but most of the middle is outsourced to Europe, to Latin America, to to China, to wherever. Sure. Furthermore, yeah, yeah. we use a shit ton of prison labor. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I mm -hmm. think something like 40% of all products in the U United States have some involvement in prison labor. And prison labor, while not slave labor, it is technically paid. It is paid pennies on the dollar for what what uh, market rates would be. Um, so all these trends kind of kind of I, I often go like where are these blue collar workers that work in factories that you can use to to do this the blue collar workers that i know of are miners are their service sector workers which have a completely different economic structure and they're franchised which is why like you can't get good union contracts for a lot of these service sector workers because you have to negotiate with a thousand different micro owners and then a large corporation all at the same time. This has not been even acknowledged on a lot of the U S left, how big of a, how big of a, of a block to implementation of their classical union strategy. It is furthermore, politically um, political unionizing in the U S is illegal. Mm -hmm. um, Taft Hartley yeah. makes it so. And right. there is, we can't even get the PRO Act through an infrastructure bill. They are not going to reverse Taft-Hartley. That is not dealing with the fact we're, you know, like Germany, but more so a highly federated country where labor laws are largely the province of the states, um, not the federal government. Um, so, for example, I've lived in states where public sector unions are illegal. You can have associations but you cannot strike, you will go to prison. So, you know, and this is something that is poorly understood even by parts of the U.S. And the Jacobin left in the U.S. is in the richest parts of the country per capita. Like, New York, the Jacobin left, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're not rich. They are not rich. It, uh, there's a myth that the, the DSA and all that is rich. They're not. They're mm -hmm. slightly, they are slightly better off than the general population. Um, but only slightly there, there are more, there's less people in the DSA who are absolutely poor, which you would expect because poor people can't afford dues. Um, of course, yeah. so, you know, um, but, but what you do have to look at is they're in the richest areas of the country that have different levels of public infrastructure in different labor laws. Um, one of the things that you can look at that is New York can afford to have generous labor laws, frankly, in ways that the Southeast cannot. Um, because of so, the higher rates of profitability, right? So, well, it's higher rates, it's just it's more, more raw money, even like there's just more mm -hmm. accumulated money there, so they can mm -hmm. pay more out. And yes, there's higher rates of profitability. And, and one of the reasons why there's higher rates of profitability is that the industries in New York and California are rent based, they're not commodity mm -hmm. price based. Um, mm -hmm. finance, tech, anything that involves intellectual yeah. property, those are those are those are rents, not. Um, they're not really, re it has a different relationship to profitability. What is unclear because no one's studying it, and I don't know that anyone's really even tried, is trying to figure out why these rents um, are only possible in highly productive economies, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that would be a good Marxist project because yeah. it, you know, m modern monetary theory is it becoming the big answer to Marxism on the left, which is uh, in vulgar form you can print your way out of problems because because currency is yeah. decoupled from from pretty much everything and it can compel labor by credit and uh and debt and that you only tax not to correct revenues um but to destroy liquidity um to mm -hmm. stop inflation um mm -hmm. and and uh you, there are people working on trying to apply this to the peripheral countries and we'll come up with theories for it. But I've never had a good explanation of how that works on the international market. And to me, Greece is the primary example of why that's impossible. Because if we look at Soriza, it was it had austerity from the EU, our austerity, our austerity by being a closed off economy shut out of global trade. Those were its two options. And Soriza right. knew it. You know, whatever Varoufakis says, he ultimately knew that. I, I don't know why people take him seriously still, but <laughs> that's my, you know, my really aggressive yeah, take yeah, sure. today. But, but, <laughs> um, 
But that seem you, that that dynamic doesn't seemingly apply in the eurozone as a whole, even though you know they will say it's political reasons why Germany doesn't allow it. Um, it does, you know. So then the UK, the US, Japan, Australia, all weirdly all the Anglo countries and the what you know the Asian countries that got sucked into the Anglo sphere um, are the are the are the only places that have true currency so sovereignty, and seemingly. They can do this, you know, um, currency stuff. But what what they don't look at is the relationship to rents. An example of that, um, and this is why I am beginning to worry about the popularity of MMT. Um, MMT has a lot of programs that, if implemented, even from a Marxist point of view, would be good. But it also has programs that, if implemented, are disastrous. Massive quantitative easing, low bank to bank lending. Um, which encourages people who already hold capital to buy massive holdings and extract rents, um, which is exactly what we're seeing in the United States uh, mm -hmm. is, is these massive rent seeking industries. And these, these are the industries that dominate the areas where the, where the Jacobin left is the most prominent. So one thing you have to ask is why are all these people who live in places where there literally aren't these factories and things, these blue power people, that they are fetishizing don't exist there. Why are they obsessed with them and obsessed with organizing them when they're not in the area to do it? They haven't looked at the actual objective economy. And one, one has to assume that a large part of what is driving this is simply fucking nostalgia. Um, and hope yeah, looking they, back at the 20s and looking at the SPD and looking at... Uh, yeah, it's, it's the SPD, FDR, you know, and all, FDR, also... FDR, exactly, yeah, right. yeah. But also, and, you know, Michael Brooks and I used to fight about this, but I, I, would, I would tell him that stuff wasn't as good for the working class as you think it was. You know, um, mm. what was FDR's role project? To stabilize banking? To to uh, increase employability and to return profitability at the cost of wages. Like if you look at what the WPA actually did, it did get a lot of people jobs, but it also kept wages down. Like that's there's study after study that proves that people don't want to look at that because, because, okay, it did save a lot of people from utter poverty because there was work at all. Um, and so it, to paint it as just, you know, negative is not, fair but it did suppress wages and it also got people buying into the idea that you didn't strike during these time periods so both from the end mm -hmm. of um yeah. from the end of the 30s up and through world war where you had the patriotism reason it was a strike suppressor the entire time when strikes would have been probably the most effective right so are you saying that roosevelt was not a leftist <laughs> yes, obviously. Um, <laughs> uh, not at all. I, 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 and I find, I find this nostalgia. I mean, to me, it's similar to the nostalgia that people have for for Stalin or for Deng. It's um, it's nostalgia for for something that you don't even really know. Um, um, I, I mean, yeah, I honestly yeah. think that's also why there's a lot of people who don't know much about China who are rabid china fans because they need to believe that somewhere on earth the society that they want actually exists so they can say that it is possible um, it's more it's more of a psychological mechanism than it is political at all right exactly like, i mean because what, what, what even if they're completely right about china and I, I don't think they are it has no implications for their political immediate lives other than maybe saying shit on twitter about geopolitics but not being able to do anything about um concrete about it at all um and that's the other thing that i would like to point out to people is that while the popularity of marxism has grown the ability of it to do much of anything has actually declined which is kind of wild um medicare for all in the united states even after a global pandemic not remotely on the table um mm. Uh, not it's less on the table now than it was before, which is kind of amazing. Um, mm. Student loan forgiveness, not on the table. There might be negotiations on dropping the interest rates. I mean, this is not something that plagues Europeans in the same way, unless you're in Britain, but it's a real problem. 
um, educational reform, really, and I'm not just talking about debts, educational reform in a real sense, because it's costly in the United States, um, sure. that really helps poor people, not on the table, um, infrastructure kind of on the table, uh, but but it's larded up with, with conservative planks to get it through the Senate. Um, so all this building, all this Bernie talk, and and what do you got? Nothing. Also, um, if you want real despair, I actually think you look like Europe, not the United States. What happened with the UK? All that Lexit talk, all the Corbyn talk, we're looking at probably 10 more years of conservative rule at best. The total recapturing of the, of the neoliberal faction of the Labour Party thus completely severing any relationship it has with historical labor outside of London. Um, so are you saying that this would be an effect or like th that's actually a result of the Bernie or the, or the Corbyn campaign? Or you think that would have happened anyway? I think it would have happened it anyway. Don't I don't matter. think it's their fault. Right. I don't want to blame them. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I think, though, is a lot of leftists got absorbed into this optimism um, in right. a way that blinded them to the results. Let's say Bernie had won. Yeah, um, then what? Then what? 90% right. of his, uh, legally speaking, 90% of his policies require Congress and senatorial sign off. Even if you had total loyalty from, say, six plus five of the, of the, um, of, you know, the DSA uh, endorsed candidates in the, the House, you have no senators after Bernie leaves. Um, and, and the hope is, and weirdly, they think they learned this from Trump, which blows my mind, is that, oh, because they won the executive, they would automatically play along. That wasn't even true with Trump and a party that was much more culty than the Democrats would ever be. Like, most of Trump's agenda was not enacted because it was not in the GOP's agenda. And what parts of Trump's agenda were enacted were mostly either things the GOP didn't care about or... Um, uh, was already part of their agenda, like messing up things with Iran or getting out of the right. um, the Paris Accords, which who cares? But and so, I mean, I say this because like they don't they were never binding, um, but whatever. Right. Um, yeah, I get the optics like it's a symbolic. It's a symbolic thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. But but most I mean, tr you know, tr even Trump's uh, immigration policy. Um, it got nastier, meaner, and more brutal. Totally true. Fundamentally, and also more spotlight. It got more spotlight. It got more spotlight. Uh, uh, under Biden, the, the border stuff has actually gone back to the brutality. And, and in some ways, it's kind of worse um, than under mm -hmm. Trump. Because the media is just not interested in it. They were at first and when he was being generous. But now that all that stuff has been, been stopped. Um, and I, a lot of the American left, this blew me for a loop, but a lot of the American left after Bernie, you have people like, I guess I'm going to call names out, Doug Henwood, who was a, a, a fairly big American left wing pun that credited Obama, who just started praising Biden for things he criticized Obama for within the first month, as if we had won, as if, you know, the Bernie campaign had massively changed the nature of the Democratic Party because it changed some some rhetoric. And it did change rhetoric. But it has changed policies not at all. Um, and, and if it had one, we'd have had to reconcile with the kind of civil war the Democrats would have had to have and what that civil war would have likely done to their ability to stay in Congress, which would have been, you know, you would have probably seen... Um, and you might still see, frankly, um, GOP sweeping through. And the reason why you might still see it uh, in the United States is that, for example, we have an eviction moratorium during COVID. And I, you know, um, it, it has not been universally enforced, period. There's been evictions, but, okay. but there are some cities where up to 49% of the population could be evicted if that was allowed to collapse. And the Democrats... Aside from a political stunt by Cori Bush, a DSA endorsed candidate, was just going to let it last because they couldn't get it through the Senate and they were just going to let it happen, which would have ensured 
they lost the next election. Um, so the idea that in America that we should feel remotely like we made any gains in the past four years, despite all this Overton window talk, is kind of a joke. Um, right. And it's a joke that what is what a lot of people have, have been coping with, frankly, is by taking more extreme ideologies on the Internet while having less and less of effect on the actual uh, politics in the United States. So you've seen this resurgence of creeping internet Stalinism that's becoming less and less internet Stalinism and more, you know, college Stalinism um, okay. in the U S influenced by interactions with global uh, people in India and even sometimes in China. Um, but that uh, is very facile. It doesn't really understand its own tradition. Um like it, it, you will have people argue for uh, like um, Xi Jinping positions as if they were Stalin's, which is crazy. <laughs> um, and and, yeah, and that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and stuff like that. Um, and it has no effect on politics in the United States, absolutely none. Um, but what it does make us look like is that we've gone crazy. It feels. And this is an un uh, this I am not making a moral equivalency here, but um, during the Obama administration, you had these right wingers uh, go nuts and start embracing more and more, you know, irony peeling themselves into more and more fascist opinions. Um, it seems like we're falling down a similar structural trajectory where we can't deal with our our own inability to make substantive change. Um, historically, movements in the United States that do this, the Ron Paul movement, the, the alt-right, etc., they collapse um, within one or two years of this trend beginning. And while like the DSA has grown massively after the Bernie failure, um, even people from the DSA said they haven't onboarded these people. They haven't done much with the 30,000 new members that they've gotten. Um, they don't know what to do with them. Um, right. And and that's from the DSA itself. Like this is not me like making accusations. I have people who were delegates to the national convention just tell me this verbatim on air. So it's 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 something that I don't think things are as good as they feel. I don't want to end on that everything being awful note though, because I do think um <clears throat> the re this reinvestment of Marxism is actually still ultimately a good thing um, because as things continue on this trajectory, these understandings of how to deal with political economy, like for all my criticisms of Marxism, you will notice that I do them almost entirely on Marxist grounds. I have Marxist assumptions um, mm -hmm. about the way political economy works, about relations and modes of production. Um, and our way out will be through trying to understand and then come up with new organize, organizational forms for acknowledging what has happened. The things that, that become immediately clear to me is right now there is a temptation in all groups, not just leftists, because globalization has turned out so poorly to double down on national answers. Given climate change and the, and the integration of our economy, this is a fundamental mistake. Um, yeah. We have to organize internationally. And it's not going to be easy because it's not entirely legal to do so. Um, it's not illegal in a lot of places, but it, there's no legal recognition for it. Um, in a way, that may be good because we have been limited by the, the force of law particularly sure, in the yes, workers yes. movement yeah i mean right um so i'm not necessarily taking an illegalist position but i'm taking a legal neutral position on how we uh, you know begin to organize um two we have been hindered by by communication technologies that have also saved us and it's a very again dialectical contradiction if you want to use marxist jargon but like it, it is a real sense that like marxism has been saved by tendencies that make organizing harder um, the internet being the primary one, we can do the education part so much easier now than we ever could. Um, but it's not helpful for organizing, at least not yet. We haven't figured out how to do that. 
if mm -hmm. if it would ever be useful for organizing anything other than i don't know a riot um we need to figure it out um so i would say for example and the dsa has finally realized i don't like the groups that it's necessarily reaching out to internationally like the the the, the workers party of brazil is kind of meh yeah they That's sent not... people they sent people even to bolivia i think or what was that Bolivia, Peru, and Venezuela. Venezuela, uh, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and they've taken they've taken a very uh, neutral to pro Venezuela position. Um, I have no problem with us going to Venezuela, but I don't think we should have sought recognition by the Maduro government. And I realize it's hard to go to Venezuela without doing that. Um, I also don't think we, anyone should be endorsing anything that you know the U.S. does to undermine the Maduro government. I think we should have gone as neutral observers, you know, it, as the U.S. left. I also partly think that U.S. left have to be very careful about what it does internationally, because particularly in Latin America, because while it is our closest neighbor and the people we need to work with the most, um, frankly, more than we do Europe, um, it is also the place where we have terrorized the most. And thus, sure, you know, like, for example, uh, Evo Morales was talking about how he didn't really see Russian and uh, Chinese imperialism as any problem for them. And, and I, I've told other leftists, like, if I were Evo Morales, I wouldn't either, because Russia and China not. are only interested in immediate, immediate regional interest. Um, but if I was Vietnam or Latvia, I'd really fucking care. So. And, and this is also my argument right now for people getting all misty-eyed about other states that they think are socialist. In, in America, there's even people doing this with Russia, which blows my mind. Um, yeah, no, this is we also have that in Germany, by the way. Yeah, we do. Weird. Is that mm. our fault? Did we import that to you? No, I don't think so. Okay. I think I, I hear it actually, yeah. No, the, the Putin is a communist thing. It started as a right. Like, it came from the right, I think. Right. There is a tr <laughs> there is a way all over the world that rightists will say ridiculous shit and leftists will eventually believe the rightists lie. Take it up and yes, take it up as exactly. a positive position. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. That's that's it. <laughs> that that has happened a lot. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, but for example, you know, if I was Latvia or even Sweden, I would be worried about Russia. But you know, it's regional politics. It's it. Um, and for all my criticisms of China, I am terrified about the U.S. taking a Cold War stance towards China, particularly yeah, of course. because of the climate crisis. Actually, more so than right. any bullshit. I, the U.S. and China aren't going to go to war. We destroy the world. We're not stupid. Um, I mean, we are stupid. We're not that stupid. Um, maybe I'm optimistic there. Maybe one of the few things I am optimistic on, but I don't think we're that stupid. But what I do yeah. see is the inability to handle climate change because the U.S. and the and China refused to fucking cooperate with each other because the U.S. is being an obstinate, you know, it, it's being it's it's being worse than the U.K. was when the U.K. lost its empire. Like, you know, China doesn't totally care what we do in Latin America. Honestly, it, it doesn't like it. Yeah, it wants trade with Venezuela and even Morales. But it you're not seeing Chinese uh, troops going in to stop the U.S. from cooing some Latin American. Press. That will not happen. Um, uh, but it very much cares our, about our pivot to Asia and the United States. And we have moved uh, Pacific Alliance stuff to Asia. Conversely, however, if people think that China is ideologically motivated, I would point out that its primary competitor in Asia right now, and the person where it has the most internal tensions, is Vietnam, the country that has very similar institutions and culture to it. Um, but to which it has been in the pre-communist period uh, an imperial aggressor and that those tensions still uh, belie their relations. Um, and so there is real invitation from groups in South uh, in Southeast Asia for the U.S. to um, maintain its position in coordinating China. This is actually all very bad. Um and it's both the it, it is primarily the U.S.'s fault, but it's not just the U.S.'s fault. And I think the inability to speak to that in a coherent way um, is a major problem. Um, while I am while I am a Marxist in the sense that I would I don't think any of these states have particular legitimacy. Um, and 
Um, I am also a person who admits that as long as we live in certain, as long as these countries exist, we do have to deal with their actual policy in the world. And a, a leftist um, foreign policy that in the interim before any revolutionary takeover, which let's be honest, is not particularly in the cards anytime real soon, um, uh, that has no responsible foreign policy. It's basically just saying revolution uh, and self-determination yeah. and, you know, let whatever fill the void. Um, and in the case of some of like a lot of American adventures in the Middle East, there is no other option. Um, that is a hundred percent the U.S.'s fault. Uh, going back to before even the war on terror, like us messing yep. with uh, local tensions with the Soviets in Afghanistan. I mean, this goes back 40, 45 years um, to states that don't even exist anymore. But it is it is something that uh, there's a long history to. Um, and in those cases, you, you really do just have to let things play out as they're going to play out. Um, in other cases, a left, a left in the United States and Europe has to take a responsible um, de-imperial policy um uh and not just say, not just say either leave everything up to their own things but have responsible diebacks make deals with other powers without endorsing those powers because we shouldn't be endorsing affairs and governments we don't understand either um but you have to deal with with these things as they actually exist and i think that's also a bind that marxists don't really have a good historical framework for dealing with because we never thought we'd be dealing with states this powerful we did not um uh the the idea of insurrectionary revolution as it was understood by marx really is based on the kinds of states that existed in europe um yeah. 150 years ago so right. That is something we have to change our conception of revolution. And I also think, to go back to one last point, this idea that we can just do it piecemeal, we're going to uh, sweep into you know to the parliament, and they're just going yeah. to let us because we have democratic legitimacy. Um, I think that's naive. And I think, I mean, I think Ingalls was very clear and 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 right that when that happens, they're still going to fight us. It might not be in an outright civil war, but it will be violent. And that's something that has to be understood um, if you're going to try to have an electoral strategy. Because the right, frankly, has better paramilitary than we do. We, 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 we suck at that. Um, and in the United States, for example, where it's easy to get guns, I still wouldn't tell most leftists to do so. Sure, yeah. No, I mean, in, in the discussions that I that I have here in Germany and the stuff that I also see sometimes in the comments, like on the left, you basically have either this position that you you will not or we should not we should not need violence in order to to bring bring on um, bring on the revolution, basically, and this is what our policy should be, or radically, you know embracing violence and saying nothing will work without violence and let's just let's just go all out and attack them right now basically and yeah. burn cars and stuff like that and, uh, and eventually get mowed down in mass when you're an actual if you were an actual exactly threat. so so and and this this <laughs> stance that you just um you just brought which is basically yeah it, it, like realizing that there will be violence even if we don't want it there will be violence brought up against us but at the same time uh, that we we cannot change everything through violence, at least not in the state that we are now, like by far. No, I mean, I actually even buy the trauma theory that if we were to change everything through violence, we'd also be changing ourselves in such a profound way, we would have trouble ruling afterwards. For mm. example, I mean, I, I do believe that Star Stalin's paranoia was brought on by the fact that during the, the, the his his time in the Bolshevik, party uh in the early period um and before the revolution um he had to be that paranoid because there really were people out to get him and that right. extends throughout his life in ways that are destructive um i you know i'm i'm not one of those people who actually thinks that stalin was actually some evil mastermind you know just there to corrupt the revolution i think he really believed in what 
he said. He really believed in the parts of, of Lennon that he glommed on to. Um, I think he believed it sincerely. And if anything, it would have been a little better if he didn't believe it as completely as he did. Um, right, right. The conviction. Um, yeah. The conviction was a problem, but also yeah. the paranoia was rational for the way he was surviving, particularly if you understand the situation in Georgia. And I don't say this as stone apologetics. I just think it's realistic. So when you when you encourage like rabid, violent, sectarian madness um, and civil war, and I mean, let's be honest, the people who encourage this have probably yeah, no. not even seen, you know, your average street murder, particularly in Europe. Um you know much less war um yeah and so yeah, it's yeah, i agree and, and so it's it's just i can't take it seriously i i guess living in mexico where i lived through a cartel war like i i have a very different yeah. view <laughs> of of violence um and yeah. uh and it's and it's efficacy and lack um you know uh i also think a lot of a lot of uh leftists um basically uh naive pacifism is will get you killed like frankly right um right. so it's you you do kind of have to take a it seems like a cop out but you do kind of have to take a center ground on this like yeah a balanced well, approach exactly yeah like I mean, I, 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 yeah mm -hmm. Barn, I, I've taken so much of your time already. It's like one and a half hours now. Uh, I, I just want to like close with one question mm -hmm. you know, because you kind of already answered some of my other questions and then let you go. Um, what about your podcasting? Because you were actually talking about how, how it got easier for us to, to educate. Um, and, and the idea basically, I mean, that so, socialists always used to do that, right? The leaflets and, and, and and the speeches and the lectures and the schools and stuff like that. And now we have the internet and it's just that much more easy to reach people. But when I think about my podcasting, I must like, honestly, I, I have my doubts. A, like, am I really the right person to teach everyone? I think I actually, I'm, I'm rather the right person to learn from guys like you, for example. So I basically podcast with the goal of getting people here that have something to say and then learn from them myself. And then maybe people can watch how I learn or something like that. Um, but what is your theory of change there? Because you are very active in this world. You have quite a few podcasts going on. Like this is basically part of your life. Um, is that part of your, do you see that as part of your activism and, and part of your contribution to getting there? So there's my, comp my answer that's actually a little complicated. Um, I always thought with a Pat Buchanan quote that I think people should listen to uh, very carefully. Um, Movements that cannot take power mature into businesses and decline into grifts. And to translate that to people who don't maybe know what that means, because it's kind of colloquial. Uh, the idea is movements start off with an educational movement when they don't have access to power. Um, to maintain that educational apparatus, they have to develop financial apparatuses to do yeah, so money yeah they need money mm -hmm. and so they become more and more like businesses ngos are frankly cults um but and if they don't have an effect they become vehicles to just drain entertainment money they become a form of entertainment um mm -hmm. i kind of have a, an antagonistic relationship to my audience on purpose so that they don't think I'm there to entertain them. Um, it's actually a disagreement I have with a lot of the rest. Like, I, I think BreadTube is an abject failure. Um, and I say this as a person who you can find me on YouTube. But uh, I, 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 I think most of it becomes entertainment. Often, even at the expense of the people doing the entertaining. Like I've seen some of these people completely destroy their personal lives, uh, right. ruin their credibility. Um, so with that in mind, that's got to be kept in the background of what I'm saying. Um, I think about half of my audience will do something with what I'm teaching them. And when I say my audience and when wow. I go to broader audiences, like, like zero books, I zero books or anything large, more like one in a hundred. Right. 
and that's not an insult to my audience. It's just, it's just a lot of people, the larger the audience, the more casual people who are not really paying that much attention are going to be involved. Um, they're going to hear parts of it that kind of reaffirm what they think they already know and move on. Right. And that, I know that, like, I accept that some days I get mad about it. Um, but I accept it. You know, uh, when I go on something like a, this is revolution, it's probably like one in four, you know, um, mm -hmm. it depends on, it depends on the audience. Um, and I don't think that's based on education or anything like a lot of the people who've really understood what I've said have not been formally educated. Actually, it's based on willingness to really engage and to be kind of self vulnerable. And the other thing is I don't want anyone thinking I have all the answers to everything because I don't like, if you ask me, how are we going to organize Marxism in the future? I can tell you things we shouldn't do, but I can't really tell you everything that we should do, except that it has to be international. Yeah. It has to be, you know, you, you have to deal with the, the, the fact that capital is global. You, you can't double down on nationalism right now. Um, and it is defensible for very specific groups like Palestinian nationalism. Unfortunately, I think the Jewish, the, the Jewish state in quotation marks has made that unviable, but I would never condemn it. Yeah. Um, right. I think that's a dumb position to take, but, um, you know, um, at the same token, like anytime you can break down, uh, national orientations and national boundaries at, at an expense where both sides are treated, this is a this is a key point where both tribes are treated as equals. You should try. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. So I got I, I derailed myself. Um, <laughs> um, you were you were you were, you were oh, talking yeah, so about I'm you not that. having so, the answer to everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's important. Reaching out to an international audience is important. You will notice that on. Not on what I do with zero books, which which is unfortunately either American or European, because that's the history of the left. It's easily accessible, frankly. Um, and even and even with the German stuff, I'm constantly finding that weirdly we haven't translated a lot of the key documents in English, even though we've been writing about it for a hundred years. So it's like. <laughs> Like, uh, like every okay. now and then someone will throw this German thing at me about like, oh, well, yeah, this thing with the all German, you know, the, with the uh, Kowski's party after the split, here's this document. And I'm like, no one's ever translated this. So I didn't even know about it. <laughs> Thank you for giving it to me in German so I can figure it out. Uh, <laughs> so like I, I run into that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But the international reach is super important, which is why I do it. It's also why I'm constantly interviewing people from Latin America, um, from right. Asia, um, not the kind of celebrity culture that, because that is something I'm worried about in the U S is there's becoming a left celebrity culture. And a lot of these people are not bad. I mean, Michael Brooks, which we were talking about off air, brought a lot of us together and he was definitely one of these. Um, right. But um, so I don't want to condemn it, but there's a limit to that. Like uh, when, mm -hmm. when uh, the Palestinian, the recent, the recent Palestinian crisis, I have to say, as if there isn't one every year. Um, or a constant uh, one, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, people, I wanted to get people on to talk about the situation. Actually, unfortunately, it was Ramadan, so getting actually people from Palestine was very hard. <laughs> so I yeah. ended up getting um, American and, and British specialist on, but uh, our Canadian and British specialist on. But it, people Gene wanted Cuba, me to, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted, I, I wanted to get people, and people kept on asking me to get Norman Fekelstein, and I respect Norman Fekelstein with a few caveats. Um, I mean, like I think the Holocaust industry is a very useful book, um, but uh, I also think having a celebrity leftist represent all this is not wise. Um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that no, I agree. Yeah. particularly in a situation like Palestine, you actually do need a bunch of voices who understand the local situation um, better and you know can communicate it um, in a language that we can speak, which is a big limitation on the US left because it's English bound. Um, sure. And that's been yeah. a huge problem. Um, even, even when uh, I 
I do educational stuff on Latin America, I often have trouble, like with the situation in Cuba recently, um, uh, I had a trouble getting people to understand that it was larger than the embargo, but that the narrative coming out of Miami was false. For those of you who don't know, Miami is full of yeah. rich expatriate Cubans. Right. Um, uh, because all the documents on it were actually from like Bolivia and Argentina and Cuba itself. And none of them were in English. And even though Spanish is a, I mean, hell, like the United States has, a, as I think the largest number of Spanish native Spanish speakers in the world in it, um, actually, which is kind of crazy. Um, it's either, it's either that or it's second after Mexico, one of the two. Um, wow. yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, we, we still are so English bound that like I had trouble getting people who were not Latino to, to, to even go through Google translate and look at Spanish documents for their sources and not trust English documents. Cause I'm just like, just Google translate it. It, 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 <laughs> it, it, it won't be perfect, but I like, yeah, you you'll, can, you'll get the gist. You'll get yeah. the gist. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and this is actually a real problem with stuff like the Middle East, um, for example, where like, I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but but like uh, a lot of news sources in the Middle East sound one way in English. But if you translate their Arabic version, it's completely different news. Um, All right. Uh, like yeah. uh, the biggest example is Al Jazeera. Uh, Al Jazeera, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, it's very yeah, liberal it's even... in English, but yeah, absolutely. not at all in yeah. Arabic. Um, it's a completely it's a completely different editorial team also I mean they're yeah. like nearly different companies yeah. um and so you know the English boundness of of uh, the the US left is a big problem um you know luckily for us and I guess it's one of the the few benefits of being a hegemon almost everybody speaks our language kind of um because yep. we make them <laughs> um, kind of like yep. you know German in Europe uh <laughs> You know, but also, I guess, but also English, <laughs> um, yeah, um, English too. Yeah. Um, English more, English more, mm -hmm. uh, but Europeans usually speak three languages and Americans usually speak 1.5 or less than one or, um, right. and it's, and I say this as a person who I'm, I'm, I'm not fluent in, um, in anything but English and maybe, um, uh, um, maybe reading and writing Spanish. Uh, um, and I, I am completely cognizant and understanding most Latin American Spanish. Um, but the language barrier is a huge, huge issue. Um, and so I've aimed my show increasingly to fill in that gap. Um, yeah, that's fair. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Also because I think, um, because I'm concerned about this international stuff, the educational mission has to be to give people the tools to interact with each other and understand each other's context and to get over um, the hurdles of things that we, you know, don't understand or we think about each other. Like when I hear Europeans talk about Americans, I'm also, I, I, I do feel like, like one, sometimes, particularly, no offense, but particularly with Germans, a lot of your anti-American stuff is like our own negative stereotypes about ourselves. Like, it's like, <laughs> did you get this from watching US TV? Like, uh, well, we're watching, we're watching all your movies, right? Sure. Exactly, like all your movies. So, I'm like, you believe the negative stuff that we say about ourselves without the context for it, but um, and it, it was also funny because I would have like really anti American academics who had total US taste and they were from Germany, like, I would meet these people. I mean, even even 20 years ago, like they would talk about like a U.S. and British literature and this and the other. And I'm like, but they would really mm. have this problem with the United States. And I'm like, but. But uh, why are you studying our literature? Like, <laughs> like yeah. um, it, I don't I really it's, I'm like I'm not saying this as a as as a as a as a gotcha. Like, I really don't understand. Um, um, but um, and so it's. I think that's that contextualization needs to be there, um, uh, particularly with Europeans, um, actually, because um, Americans and Europeans think we understand each other. Um, and I've discovered from living there for a little while um, in continental Europe, I've actually never been to the UK, the actual English speaking parts of Europe, I've not been to right. ever. Um, 
but we don't actually understand each other. We don't have the same views on race. We don't, I mean, and I don't mean that like one of us is racist and one of, like our racism is different. Um, mm -hmm. Our understandings of the immediate past are different, but since we are part of a big trade block, we're part of a, a big international mega polity in a way, we don't realize that. Um, and we, and we share so much of the same popular culture. I mean, really mm -hmm. it's like, but we can talk a lot about Netflix stuff and movies, yeah, totally. and music and arts and all the stuff. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, but that's even true. When I was in Egypt, that was even true amongst the rich. Like everybody. It's, uh, it's true. Netflix. Probably true all over the world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. I mean, um, but then when I would try to contextualize things broader, for example, uh, Donald Trump was more well liked in Egypt before he declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel, uh, than Barack Obama. There are local reasons for that that have to do with Obama's waffling during the Arab Spring, um, sure. that have to do with him being seen as a like as a possible way out of US um Muslim tensions that I mean his very first speech was in Cairo, wasn't yep. it? Yep. And he was welcome with yeah. open arms. Exactly. You know, yeah. by after Bush, yeah, sure. But by the end of the Arab Springs, he was hated in Cairo. And I think he got he got people. the Peace Nobel Prize. He got the Peace Nobel Prize just for that speech. Pretty just much. for that speech. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and 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 uh, and it was funny because the 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 um. The very rich people that we were teaching in, in Cairo, of course, because, you know, we're teaching in a, an American language school in Cairo. You can imagine what the tuition would be. Um, it's probably it was probably more than the average Egyptian makes in a year. Um, mm. uh, in fact, I know it was. Um, and of course, they all, you know, had the same uh, political fears about Trump that that we did. But when you went out into the street, um, and if you could find people who spoke English, or if you could, you know, rustle your way through some Egyptian street Arabic, um, you would realize that that like Donald Trump was kind of popular uh, with 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 working class Egyptians because they were angry at Obama's inaction on the Middle East. And it it was like the devil that was admitting he was the devil, kind of. And also, yeah, they yeah, were, yeah. We there had, were, yeah, there were parts of Trump's policy that were specifically kind to Egypt. So, for example, when they had the whole Muslim ban, Egypt was never included in that. Um, mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, uh, you know, stuff like that. So, oh yeah, but this devil, the devil, the devil that shows that he's a devil, like taking the mask off, basically the mask of the empire. I mean, that was that also was like a narrative that we had here in Germany, but especially also in Palestine. I mean, in the beginning before he did the the embassy stuff and positioned yeah. himself so strongly everybody thought that hey that it's actually good to to have it out in the open and not have have the beautiful barack obama face i mean one of the things that uh donald trump says that people people haven't even picked up on because they hear the america great again rhetoric is that he would talk about how he didn't really believe in american exceptionalism um i mean you know uh I see Donald Trump as like, you know, the 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 end of a certain kind of a, a Republican aristocratic bourgeoisie. Now we have like the nouveau riche gauche, completely unhithered, but kind of honest. Um, yeah. In a fucked up way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, not that he was going to undo American empire. That was a delusion. And, and uh, that has become, I hope, clear to a lot of people. But right. Um, the, the, it, I also was at sometimes I was like, well, you know, he's just saying the quiet parts loud and that's what you're pissed off about. Like, like he does horrible shit, but our leaders have done horrible shit for a hundred and well, probably since we've had leaders. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know, because, of, okay, I'm about to say, when do they not do horrible shit? Oh, when they were slaveholders. So never mind. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, yeah. so Barn, yeah, Barn, anyway. I feel, I feel obligated to let you go. It's been yeah, nearly two you. hours.
No, thank you so much for being here. It was such a pleasure. Uh, I, I, my head is buzzing, as always, after listening to you. Um, so, but I, I would like to go, let you go now so, so that I have a prospect of getting you back on the show at some time. Um, yeah. Thanks for being here. Everybody check out Barn Vlog on YouTube. Check out Mortal Science. Check out Pop to the Left and Theorizing with a Hammer. I might warn books. people not to check out Mortal Science at first, though. So. Like that's, <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's maybe that's the that's, deep, that's not the, the deep gateway end of the pool. <laughs> exactly, that's the gateway, um, right? Yeah. Um, okay, and thanks a lot, everybody, and gute Nacht, bis bald. Leute, wir brauchen eure Hilfe. Und zwar als allererstes, folgt uns bitte überall, wo ihr uns folgen könnt. Wir sind auf YouTube, auf Facebook, auf Twitter. Wir sind jetzt mittlerweile auch auf Twitch. Gebt uns Instagram. Dort, äh, Instagram sowieso, genau. Gebt uns dort einen Follow. Äh, liked dieses Video bitte. Überhaupt jedes Video, das ihr euch anschaut, bitte liken. Warum nicht? Ist doch einfach nur ein Klick da. Damit helft ihr uns ungemein. Wenn ihr uns abonniert auf YouTube, klickt auch die Glocke. Dann werdet ihr immer informiert, wenn wir live gehen. Dann könnt ihr dazukommen. Äh, je mehr Leute live mit uns unterwegs sind, desto äh, besser sind dann auch die Views und desto besser ist das für den Algorithmus. Wir haben außerdem ein Patreon-Konto. Genau. Patreon.com slash 99 zu 1. Wenn ihr so richtig dabei sein wollt, äh, könnt ihr euch Membership-Level aussuchen. Wir haben drei verschiedene Stufen. Es gibt dann solche Sachen wie zum Beispiel diese neuen Nachspielepisoden, wo wir jetzt die erste gemacht haben. Und äh, ihr habt auch Zugang zu unserer Discord-Community. Weiters haben wir einen paypal.me slash 99 zu 1 Link, falls ihr denkt, naja, sind schon schnaffte Typen, aber mehr als einmal will ich nicht zahlen, dann könnt ihr uns da auch ein bisschen Geld schicken. Wir haben tatsächlich inzwischen relativ signifikante laufende Kosten, weil wir einen hohen Qualitätsanspruch haben. Insofern, wir sind wirklich auf eure Unterstützung angewiesen an der Stelle. 